On a regular basis, I, I ride my Harley to work, and so my uniform here at Life is usually blue jeans, boots, and a Life Pacific Golf shirt. So wearing a suit, in some ways, I'm, I'm a stranger in a strange land. <laughs> so if you would excuse me for just a moment, Did is it just the middle button or the top two buttons, and you don't know? What's, what's GQ saying, DZ? This maybe. Okay. Anyway, hi, everybody. It's, it's good to see you. I don't know that I've ever been more inspired in my life than listening to those panelists or more proud of our graduates as they are all over the world touching the world for Christ. If you wanted to change the world, what would you do? Knowing what you know about people and God and history, yourself, what would you do if you really wanted to change the world? Maybe you would personally work harder at it. Go more places, do more things, rest less. Do more. You can catch your breath when you get to heaven. And if you did that, your, the impact of your life would probably go up, but your life expectancy would go down. And you would probably discover that whatever bump you made wasn't worth the cost. Or you might say, no, I want to change the world, and I want to be biblical about it. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to go to the Great Commission, and I'm going to obey the command to make disciples. To change the world, you would invest your life in someone, and you would help them change. And then after they've grown, you would say, now you go disciple someone, and I'll go disciple someone. And then after those four, then those four would go disciple someone. And then you do that long enough, you're going to change the world. Like that illustration that is kind of common where if you took a penny, and every day you doubled that... At the end of 30 days, you would have a million dollars. You're going to go home tonight and say, uh-uh, yeah, it's true. If you double one penny and two, then four, then eight, then 16, and 32 cents, and eventually, you would have a million dollars. But you can know that illustration all you want. We all probably know it, but at the end of the day, we all still broke. <laughs> so even though that second approach has far more impact than the first one, I don't think it ultimately gets the job done. To get to what I believe the best and most effective answer is, is I think we have to go to Jesus and see how he responded when he saw a world that had a level of need that was even too much for him to go to. As incredible as Jesus was and is, even he saw that the answer was not in him working harder or even going up into the hills and teaching a handful. But this passage out of Matthew gives us his response when looking at the overwhelming need of the world. Matthew 9.35 says, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Paul applied this and said it this way in 2 Timothy 2.1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. On the things you have heard from me, say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to allow men who will also be qualified to teach others. To change the world, we must raise up, train, and release leaders who can lead others to greatness. Bill Hybels oft-quoted statement, I believe the church is the hope of the world, might be better translated, the church as the spirit-filled and spirit-empowered people of God, equipped for ministry by humble, healthy leaders going out and being Christ in the marketplace, business world, highways, and byways, 
is the hope of the world. Any enterprise, including the church, without good leadership fails. Every enterprise rises or falls with leadership. Where leaders lead, people go. Where leaders fail to lead, people do not go. The most effective way, in my opinion, to change the world is to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into his harvest field. And that is precisely why Life Pacific College was established over 85 years ago, to prepare leaders for a lifetime of ministry. That is why we exist, and that is why we will always exist, to prepare leaders for a lifetime of ministry. Amy Semple McPherson began Life Bible College to train a generation to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and she did it with cutting-edge innovation. She pushed the envelope using the technology of her time, radio, and drama. She required life students in the 20s to take Spanish when they were in school. So great was her burden to reach the Spanish-speaking community in Los Angeles in the 20s. Graduates were sent from Life Bible College in the 20s to unreached and dangerous sections of the globe as missionaries with a radical, never-before-seen strategy to get there, train nationals, and turn the work over to them. And it worked. She broke a gender glass ceiling and affirmed a woman's call to ministry. She built Angela's temple in 1923, three years before a woman could not vote in the United States of America. Three years after women received the right to vote in our country, a single woman named Amy Semple McPherson built the largest freestanding dome west of the Mississippi, a beautiful structure that shocked the world, a structure dedicated to the cause of interdenominational worldwide worldwide evangelism. She spearheaded compassion ministries and fed more people during the Depression than the city of Los Angeles did. In the 20s, the Bible college movement was just beginning. And at a time when this odd thing that the world had never really seen much of, a Bible college, was begun, she finessed that institution into great effectiveness so that life graduates eventually circled the globe like a great purple, blue, yellow, and red line bringing the message of God's grace to the world. For you that took polity, that's the colors of our flag. <laughs> the rest of you are going, I don't even know there are people that color. Anyway. <laughs> but we are at a crossroads as a school. We can entrench ourselves in tradition and do things the way that we have done them for the last few decades. We can work hard and prepare leaders who can be very, very effective in 1956. And we can struggle. Or we can return to our roots, and as this panel exemplified, move into the cutting-edge innovation that is a mark of our movement. It's how our movement began, and set our sights on preparing leaders for a lifetime of ministry who can be effective in the year 2020. That's what we need to prepare for. You see, this generation is gripped with a call of God. Within this generation, God is calling thousands and thousands to be great pastors, youth pastors, worship leaders, CE directors. They don't know it yet, but God is raising up leaders for his church. He will, he said, I won't leave you as an orphan. I won't abandon you. 
That tells me that he will make sure that he sends leaders to lead his precious bride. And I'm glad that he's doing that because we are now facing the graying of the four square ministerium. One district is facing in the next few years a 50% turnover through retirement. 50% of the pulpits in the next 10 to 15 years are going to be empty in this district. We need now more than ever a school that trains great pastors more than we have ever needed it before. We must never back off on our assignment to, graze, to raise up, train, disciple, and release great leaders for ministry. Our pulpits must thunder again if revival is ever going to come to this country. Meek, mild-mannered, soft sell, I don't want to offend you kind of preaching will not win the day. What will win the day is the scandal of the cross. And our pulpits must thunder again. And to do that, we must prepare leaders who are not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but recognize it as the power of God unto salvation. First for the Jew, then for the Gentiles, and then for me, a Mexican. And I'm telling you right now, our hope, our plans, and everything we are giving our lives for it here at Life Pacific College is that we plan and are working to send out more pastors and church leaders into the field over the next 20 years than have ever been sent out before. LPC exists to resource the field for the harvest, and it will never deviate from that. As God helps us. But we are also discovering another powerful placement of the call of God in the next generation's lives. If you were to sit with our amazing student body and ask them if they feel a call of God to ministry, the vast majority, 98%, I'm sure, would say to you, yes, unequivocally, yes. But if you ask them if they see themselves in one of those four roles I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of those that say, yes, I feel a call, would say, no, I I don't feel a call to that. And then you would understandably say, really? Well, what do you feel a call to? And then you will see the creative nature of God. You will see these young people that are called to build orphanages. They're called to help end human trafficking through making disciples for Jesus Christ. They feel a call to drill water wells and then connect that water well with a church planter and partner together to reach a valley. They're called to pastor a business. They're called to teach in a close country and make disciples as an undercover missionary, knowing that it may cost them their lives. And they'll say, yeah, but oh man, how cool would that be? That is not my call, by the way. And on and on and on. You know, as late as the 60s or the 70s, A high school diploma was the baseline for getting a job in America. They'd ask you, do you have a high school diploma? And that was kind of the the, the baseline. Not anymore. An accredited bachelor's degree now starts the process. As our panel so profoundly and beautifully illustrated, our graduates are changing the world in amazing and in creative outside-the-box ways, as well as effective, powerful local church ways. This is where Life Pacific, I believe, must return to our roots, namely equipping leaders for a lifetime of ministry to the world in which they live. So dream with me for just a couple of minutes of an LPC in the year 2020 
that would have the finest biblical studies and transformational ministry majors in the world, where students are prepared to be church leaders who make disciples and grow healthy churches that train and release people to be Jesus to their world. But also dream with me of dual degrees for ministry that couple biblical studies with business, for example, graduating trained ministers with an accredited business degree who are truly equipped to use this powerful combo to be about their father's business. Or a worship and arts major, or a dual Bible and teaching major, or how about this, a dual ministry and social work major, opening doors for our graduates to minister in settings and ways that if they have never been able to minister before. Never education in the name of nobody, or never education for education's sake, but preparing leaders for a lifetime of ministry in the world of 2020. Dream with me of a life Pacific college with multiple master's degrees designed to help those that are in the field presently, raising the leadership quotient of those we call leaders so that they can truly and effectively lead at a higher and higher capacity, all primarily done online without ever having to leave their place of service except for a brief week at the beginning and in the middle. Now, dream with me of a life Pacific college that serves as the hub of a global strategy to train and equip leaders all over the world, serving a church that numbers over 8 million people worldwide. We may not always recognize the treasure that we have in Life Pacific, but the global church does. They say to me when I travel to other lands, that's the school that sister started. And it's a school that's been doing education and training for over 85 years. Can you help us? We can help. And with technology, we can serve the world from San Dimas. This is your LPC of the year 2020. Not 500 students, not 1,000 students, but thousands of students all over the world who are not there to make life great, not to make life great or a success but who are there being served by Life Pacific to reach the world for Christ. We have an open door right now as we have never had before. We have before us an open door to do all of the things I've listed and more. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. But Life Pacific College is poised to not become great, that isn't my concern, but to serve to greatness for square, sister movements, emerging colleges and institutes, and the local church. That we might be that kernel of wheat that falls in the ground and serves this next generation as they become what I believe is going to be the greatest generation of leaders the church has ever seen. Life Pacific College, preparing leaders for a lifetime of ministry and going to a world, not that was, but as the world is and will be. But we cannot do it without your help.